Hello and good day, everyone. Um, I'm going to start this session, even though we're still waiting for some people to enter. Um, I will I will um, start with uh, with some practicalities for this uh, meeting. Um, first of all, welcome to the first webinar in our series of talks on uh, restoring river continuity. Uh, my name is Eve Silver and I work for Wetlands International European Association. Um, before we kick off with the talk, I would like to um, share with you a few practical practicalities, as I said. Um, first of all, please note that this session is being recorded and we will publish it online afterwards. Um, so you will also be able to view it back, but there won't be any interaction if you watch it online. Uh, second, um, I will mute all the microphones of all participants so that only the presenter will be able to uh, to speak. Um, if you want to ask any questions, please wait till the end of the session and uh, please post your questions in the chat function, uh, which you can see in the panel on the right. Um, I will collect all the questions and we will be able to answer them uh, after the presentation. So you can post them already or you can wait till the end and then post them. Um, but please uh, do not interrupt the presentation. Um, so we will allow the speaker to have his entire talk before we answer questions. Um, and then uh, last, we will close this session about an hour and a half from now on. Um, that's it for now. I'm, I'm giving the floor to Andrea Goltara from the Italian Center for River Restoration. Italian Center for River Restoration. And he will give a brief introduction to this webinar. Enjoy. Thank you, Dave. Welcome also from my side to this first webinar. My name is Andrea Goltara. I'm the managing director of the Italian Center for River Restoration, which is an Italian NGO while Wetlands International, the European Association, is a network of similar NGOs, including CHIRF. And we both have as one of our main goals to preserve and to restore rivers and, and, and wetlands. And in this context, the restoration of river continuity is a key challenge. So this is why we have thought that organizing uh, such a series of seminar is really I mean, important, important to us. Um, and our idea is to try to share as much as possible uh, knowledge and, and, and good practice on this issue and especially to, to foster debate. So our, our hope is that also through these kind of initiatives, we can manage to, to widen the communities of people discussing and, and sharing experiences on this topic. So it's now time to give the floor to, to Fernando. Um, Fernando Magdaleno is an eco-hydrologist specialized in river ecology and hydromorphology with a special focus on restoration of water dependent environments. He has done many things. Uh, he has also acted as Spanish representative in, in different expert groups of the European Commission. And at present he coordinates the Environmental Restoration Department at SEDEX, which is the Spanish, Spanish research agency for civil engineering and environment. And he works as assistant professor at the Technical University of, of Madrid. Um, he's also a founder and a member of the Iberian Center for River Restoration, so the, the homologous center in, in Spain and, and Portugal as chief. So, Fernando, the, the floor is yours. Enjoy the seminar. Thank you so much, Andrea. Thank you so much, Saif, and uh, welcome uh, everyone here. I'm very pleased to, to meet you today and to have the opportunity to, to show my uh, my knowledge and experience in this uh, quite uh, interesting topic of continuity of rivers, which is one essential aspect of river restoration, and which sometimes is not properly addressed when we face one restoration initiative. This uh, presentation uh, is based on the essentials of interactions between water, sediments, and biota. But of course, uh, we three here today have a very pragmatic approach 
as many of you have in your different uh, entities or associations. So uh, the presentation is uh, based first on understanding which are the, the basic uh, interactions between uh, water, sediments, and biota to convert rivers into the complex systems uh, they are. Then we will uh, discuss how much uh, and how, when, and, and, and why these uh, dynamics and connectivities are threatened. And then we will jump to uh, uh, to pragmatic questions, showing different alternatives and different approaches uh, for the improvement of those interactions when they are degraded, and uh, about the way in different countries we are managing or, or facing uh, those uh, challenges. And we conclude the, the, the session with some examples, some positive examples in urban areas, which are some of the, of the most degraded today and which require the, the higher efforts to, to contribute to their improvement. And finally, we will have some remarks which can open the debate for your comments, remarks, or for anything you want to, to bring here today. Well, first, uh, the first block is about the uh, complexity of interactions between water, sediments, and biota. Most of these questions, uh, you will probably know about them because I think you all uh, have been working uh, for, for, uh, for a while already in, in rivers and uh, maybe they are well known, but other things uh, maybe could uh, be interesting for the uh, second, third, or uh, fourth block of this presentation or for the anything you are managing today. As I said before, we are uh, we are addressing uh, one quite complex system because uh, rivers are uh, per se are open, dynamic, and complex systems which have so many interactions uh, and so many uh, aspects which are uh, found in their dynamics and behavior that uh, is quite complex. It's quite difficult to to understand them and to interpret them in a the right way when we uh, we have to tackle. Uh, these kind of, of environments. You have one slide here which shows the typical image of one perennial river with uh, so many elements uh, in the different dimensions that we will later discuss in the vertical, longitudinal, transversal, or, or even a temporal scale. So all of them must be addressed and it's quite a, a difficulty to, to, to interpret them correctly. But it's not only about perennial systems, it's also about temporary rivers as this one we have in in Mediterranean areas in Europe and in many places around the world. And these kind of systems are normally not so much uh, um, understood or so much present in even the, the legislation or the scientific terms. And we need also to uh, interpret how they, how they work, which is the, the, the behavior of the flow patterns in these kind of systems. And again, uh, even uh, being not, not perennial and not continually flowing uh, uh, throughout the year, uh, these are again complex systems which require our attention and our efforts to, to try to invert the present uh, trend to degradation. There are many uh, theoretical approaches that uh, are well known uh, and, and which uh, a picture or identify all the components of the of the river systems, including, of course, the, the active channel, the non-active channel, the riparian areas, the floodplains, terraces, but also the uh, vertical connection with the hyperaic zones, the phreatic zones, and other elements, which uh, all together constitute those uh, quite uh, difficult environments. The uh, scales of the of the river systems are uh, basically three, as uh, I previously mentioned, three in the spatial uh, terms, lateral, longitudinal, and vertical, as these a quite classical picture from World in 1989 shows. And also we have another one which is typically forgotten uh, as a temporal scale, uh, which uh, should be very well uh, described and identified because uh, sometimes we are making picture of the river evolution, which is not uh, um, connected to the present dynamics of the river. And maybe we are trying to restore some fluxes and some interactions which uh, cannot really develop today due to the constraints of the river or to any of the pressures uh, they are facing. So we have three scales for uh, spatial aspects and one scale, the fourth scale for time, which uh, is, is quite important and uh, is uh, present even in, in many scientific discussions today. The dynamics and landscape of rivers are uh, dominated by different uh, aspects, different issues. Some uh, attain to the <clears throat> catchment scale, for instance, geology, climate, land use, which are like the, <clears throat> the framework aspects uh, which are ruling the dynamics of the river. We have then some uh, control factors which are natural and, and also anthropogenic, 
uh, for instance, the flow regime, the, the bed slope, the stream power, uh, sediment transport, vegetation and management, and how we are constructing structures to, to train and to manage rivers. And they interact, they relate to a wide number of different primary factors which interact at the local scale, such as the uh, flood regime, the properties of sediment transport, including grain size, density, form, other geomorphic properties like uh, topography, uh, the, the quality or attributes of deposits, roughness, uh, animals, uh, faunal communities, flow hydraulics, uh, dead wood, which is also, you know, uh, very, very important because it controls much of the fluxes that are uh, occurring in the river, or even the properties of limitation in terms of uh, structure, composition, or distribution of the riparian stands. So all these uh, three uh, steps, all these three different phases are completely interconnected, but each of those, as we will later show, uh, is going to be a capital to, to, to back the dynamics of uh, different river systems we are uh, having to, to, to work with. About the dynamics of rivers, there is a, a quite a wide number of different uh, approaches, including theories, uh, including paradigm concepts, uh, uh, many, many different things in the scientific uh, sphere. Let me try to summarize uh, the uh, catalog of the 10 more important uh, conceptual approaches to rivers, uh, which I will very briefly uh, explain because many of them are, are quite uh, well known because they are old and classical terms, but they can uh, be updated today and, 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 uh, and brought into the present way we are uh, managing rivers. First of this is the is a quite old uh, principle, but but completely uh, applicable applicable today, like the river continuum concept from Van Ott in 1980, where he explained the, all the uh, connectivity of the gradients which uh, are happening from the source of the river to the confluence uh, with other river or or to the uh, place where he's debouching into the sea, and we have a quite a continuous gradient of different trophic. Uh, nutrients and uh, ecological networks. So uh, each of those uh, reaches or segments of the river are uh, sustaining different communities from the very primary straders, collectors in the upper areas to other kind of organisms uh, downstream. So the upper, middle and lower reaches are completely uh, adapted to the uh, features, to the flow, sediment and biota features uh, of the river, so they are, as I was saying, they are sustaining uh, so well specialized communities and they all relate to each other. So, any interaction, any um, uh, pressure on one of these uh, reaches has impact not only in that reach but on upper, upstream, or downstream uh, areas, which are uh, interconnected to the place where we are uh, regulating or uh, constructing any uh, uh, pressuring infrastructure. Of course. Let's say apart uh, about the influence of tributaries, which we will later also uh, uh, review, because also they um, affect these, uh, these these gradients and they have influence on how these gradients are moving from the headwaters to the uh, lower areas of the river. The second principle, which uh, is also quite well known, is the serialist continuity concept from Ward and Stanford. Uh, it has been updated in different uh, publications uh, recently, but still they, it remains to be one uh, primary uh, factor of knowledge uh, for river dynamics. And it explains that uh, those gradients uh, which Banot and other people uh, showed in rivers uh, are clearly understood when we introduce one uh, discontinuity in the system, for instance, one dam or one obstacle, a barrier or anything which is physically obstructing the, the, the fluxes of the river, and uh, this involves uh, changes because rivers have to uh, readapt to the conditions which are uh, giving uh, those new uh, constraining factors, like for instance dams. So uh, they uh, they showed how each of the different segments or reaches of the of the river, including the mountainous areas, the middle braided reaches, or the of the low gradient middle reaches, have different patterns, different stability, different floodplain development, different vegetation, different habitats, aquatic and riparian, 
and different pathways. So if we introduce, for example, one big dam in the middle of the, of the river, we will be enhancing that different communities are going to be uh, uh, dominating or appearing in the downstream reach, which is not typical of that area, but uh, they are there because uh, they have been uh, uh, they have found uh, conditions which uh, are completely dominated by that uh, infrastructure. For instance, downstream of the dams, uh, sometimes if uh, releases are from the bottom uh, area of the reservoir or from the upper area, uh, maybe fish communities which are typical from uh, other upstream areas or very dense uh, st uh, stands, uh, floral stands can appear, which are not typical of those of those sites. So again, these uh, discontinuities, uh, which are uh, creating a lack of continuity uh, in the serial uh, gradient of the river, is going to uh, impose, is going to enhance the appearance of uh, such different communities. Principle three is one of the of the dominant uh, paradigms in today in river science is the natural flow regime paradigm, uh, which uh, also talks about the what is uh, known as predictable diversity, which means that uh, in the flow regime, which is the main driver in in most systems, because hydrology is the driver which is uh, is controlling much of the of the processes which are occurring in the river. The, those flow regimes uh, has a have a major interaction with some essential elements of river dynamics such as water quality, energy sources, physical habitats and biotic interactions. All of these together uh, uh, are sustaining which is called ecological integrity, which is the capacity of the river to maintain one well-balanced and uh, resilient uh, number of communities and which is explained about the health of the river system. So one river system with a high ecological integrity is going to be uh, healthy and is going to be adapting uh, correctly to natural or artificial disturbances which could be happening in that segment of the river. But flow regime is not a, a, a black box, uh, but is uh, is uh, constituted by a number of flow components, uh, among uh, which the most the five most important are magnitude of the different flow events, frequency of of them, duration, timing, and rate of change. In other words, uh, we are talking about how big different flows are, when uh, they are. Uh, they are flowing, they are happening, uh, with which duration, uh, how many times uh, in the year or uh, in, a, in a longer uh, time, and how fast they are increasing or decreasing uh, once they happen. So those five components are the, the, the five uh, milestones of any flow pattern, of any flow regime, and if we understand how they five are evolving in the river, how they were in the past, how they are today and how even they will be in future according to different climatic uh, scenarios, we can understand how those four uh, attributes, quality, sources, habitats and interactions are, are going to be. And finally, we are going to understand properly how much uh, is the, the river healthy and uh, adaptable to future uh, difficult uh, scenarios. All of those uh, components have uh, a lot of uh, interactions with different processes like for instance you can see in the right area of the, of the slide this is another typical diagram from Van and Arthington which uh, a couple of others which have been working in many many places especially in Australia uh, they understood uh, the review uh, all the publications which had been made uh, up to that date on the connection between hydrology and ecology and summarize them all in that diagram, which shows that, uh, for instance, the uh, the lower flows in winter or in summer are connected to some uh, uh, spawning uh, questions or recruitment or, or many others, while, for instance, the higher flows, including the floods, which can be interannual or interannual, has a lot of responsibility on uh, promoting connectivity of the channel and the floodplain or, for instance, in creating conditions for uh, the geomorphic regeneration of the channel, which later on will involve the uh, existence of new habitats and of many uh, different ecological uh, items. So, uh, this uh, natural flow paradigm is, is, as I was saying, is one major aspect, and we have to understand very well uh, flow patterns before we 
uh, begin any restoration action because otherwise we can be failing to do anything which is really valuable. The fourth principle uh, out of 10 is uh, focused on uh, something which has been uh, uh, quite discussed in the past but which has some important things to, to say and it's called intermediate disturbance hypothesis and this is a, a typical uh, theory in, in ecology in general not only about rivers it's about also about uh, uh, atmosphere questions or forest ecology or about uh, marine ecology and it explains that uh, in any ecological system we have the highest species richness when we have an intermediate uh, level of disturbance what uh, does this say well that all systems need uh, a number of uh, disturbances of perturbations to uh, release a maximum or the best condition for uh, new habitats and new species to enter the system but if we move uh, to very low areas of the disturbance gradient or to very high areas of that gradient we are going to be rapidly suffering a decay in the number and quality of the species communities in the case of, of rivers those disturbances are especially uh, extreme events those events which are not typical uh, during the year but which are opening the door the window to new habitats new areas to to be recreated and then we will have a uh, more species because we will be finding uh, more different habitats a, a wider number of habitats so it's going to be uh, maximizing or optimizing the richness of the, of the river it's not also it's not only about the uh, flooding which is a more typical thing we may think of when we discuss about the servants in rivers but also about drafts we have uh, made different research in different med countries and we have uh, seen that in many cases the most important thing which uh, gives the higher richness to our rivers is the occurrence the maintenance of a, an adequate draft regime that is that we have drafts in places which are typically Australian areas so to avoid any artificial releases which are being done for irrigation purposes or for any other and which are creating conditions for alien species or for uh, unbalanced processes to happen in the river so we need in in our systems we need disturbances we need different uh, levels of flood not only one flood different floods uh, geomorphic floods uh, uh, flushing flows, uh, control the floods for uh, different targets, but also we need drafts and, and, and low flow periods in places which are typically uh, of that uh, condition. Principle five uh, is about uh, a related question, which is the flood pools concept, uh, especially uh, essential in places which have been quite dominated by uh, an active flood regime. And this principle from Young in 1998 uh, showed that uh, floods are capital if we want to, uh, to, to maintain healthy rivers because floods are responsible for reconnecting uh, regularly the channel and the floodplain and to allow the channel to uh, reconstruct or to bring to his uh, bed all the different nutrients, carbon, uh, phosphates, nitrates, many, many things or, 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 or silica which uh, are only uh, or, or, or partly found in the floodplain and uh, without which the channel is going to be impoverishing and, and, and losing many of, uh, of the more uh, most important cycles so we need that hand which brings periodically those nutrients into the into the water and which at the time fertilizes the floodplain and allows all the range of ecosystem services to be happening in that uh, in those areas so again floods are something uh, without which rivers cannot really live correctly principle six is about uh, something more a bit more abstract and it's called the hierarchical classification of rivers this was the device and, and uh, studied by Frisell uh, almost 30 years ago and uh, he uh, he showed clearly how systems are I constructed in different uh, hierarchical scales from the uh, stream system to the segment, reach, mesohabitats, pool refill system to the micro habitat system. So uh, each of those uh, have different uh, uh, dynamics inside or within uh, those scales, but they are totally interconnected. So uh, one upper scale cannot uh, correctly develop if the lower scales are not uh, functioning properly. 
does. In other words, if we want to restore one one reach or one segment, we need to properly understood, uh, understand and restore the pool refill or the microhabitat system. So we cannot uh, just uh, put uh, restoration practices inside the river without uh, giving opportunities to the river to uh, rehabilitate or to mitigate the pressures which are uh, imposing uh, changes or bad modifications on the meso and microhabitat systems. This um, classification or this approach has been used in many different river, in many different basins worldwide. You have here one example from the, the new basin where the different uh, segments were analyzed and where the river was uh, uh, was sonated, had a sonation, and from which uh, some restoration efforts have uh, have been done in the past. Principle seven is about the <clears throat> hyperbaric uh, corridor concept, which uh, was also explained some decades ago, and which shows also the importance for the water sediments biota interactions of a good uh, dynamics of the first uh, centimeters or first meters of the uh, of the area which is just in the uh, in the ecotone between the surface and subterranean waters in rivers. So those first centimeters have a, a wide number of bio geochemical processes uh, uh, working. So uh, also the river needs those uh, lungs to be working well because otherwise the upper the surface processes uh, we will not have a good foundation and will be facing different uh, different problems. So this is this is why it's so important to restore river beds when we try to restore the uh, dynamics of one river. And river beds are typically uh, quite damaged by regulation or by different uh, land uses or different uh, practices and sometimes they lose their uh, their structure, sometimes uh, granulometry is uh, unbalanced because of the regulation activities. In brief, they, they suffer a lot the different pressures which the river uh, is, uh, is finding uh, in uh, diverse aspects of its uh, dynamics. Principle eight, and only three ahead, is the network dynamics hypothesis. This was the, developed by a team uh, of people who's working with Leroy Poff in, in the US, and especially by, by this author, Benda, in 2000. Uh, for and uh, they explained and they showed how in different in a basin uh, there is a number of different processes which are uh, dominating the, the overall functioning of the of the basin and which are based on how is the uh, drainage network I mean uh, how is the main stem how many tributaries is is uh, is uh, is finding how these tributaries are uh, introducing uh, new fluxes, water sediments and biota in the main stem. So the, the size, the uh, dimensions, the different structure or patterns of those uh, drainage networks are going to be also behind uh, the uh, functioning, the behavior of the overall network. So this is this is why it's so important to understand uh, how and when the different tributaries are uh, incorporating new uh, elements, uh, nutrients, uh, sediments, or any other thing to the main stem to understand well how the uh, the whole picture is is working. And in their works, they um, they showed many good examples. And, and I suggest that any you interested in this uh, hypothesis review them because they are uh, really really uh, interesting. Principle nine is is more about. Uh, interaction between uh, physical chemical and uh, biological uh, cycles is called the nutrient spiraling and it uh, describes how the nutrient cycling on the downstream uh, transport is ruling all the um, different uh, physical chemical processes especially for those uh, components like uh, carbon nitrogen phosphorus silicon which are especially uh, crucial for organisms as nutrients uh, in brief, this uh, hypothesis or this theory explains that the length of the spiraling or, or or the way in which those nutrients are moving and are also being uptaken uh, uptake in, in the river are influenced by abiotic elements, for instance, flow, sediments, or chemical transformations, but also by biotic aspects, for instance, periphyton abundance of uh, microbes, uh, uptake rates, or composition of uh, the animal community. So uh, the the movement or the way nutrients are uptaken 
are uh, or is ruled by this kind of spiraling where uh, some elements are uh, cycled in the same reach while others are transported to downstream reaches from where we are studying the, the system. In this um, diagram, which is uh, took, uh, was taken from Minshall work in, in 1983, this uh, spiraling is, uh, is described for different types of systems according to how, um, how high or how low are the retention processes and the biological activity processes, and uh, they show different spiraling and they are mostly linked to different uh, streams or different order so some are more typical in upper areas while others are more typical in middle or lower reaches so this uh, question this principle is quite important to understand how uh, how nutrients are moving how much the rivers uh, can um, uh, auto depurate some of the the contaminants the nutrients which maybe they have in excess and uh, to uh, to link those uh, chemical, biological aspects with other uh, of the elements which uh, I have explained in the previous slides. And finally, in principle 10, uh, there is a typical aspect or typical question which uh, we were explained when we were young in, in most places, in most schools or colleges, and which are interactions between channel, floodplains, and basins. You all know that uh, today, presently, in, in Europe and in in the global sphere, we all are trying to understand rivers as as, as uh, systems which are dominated by what's happening in the basins. So the present uh, uh, legal framework in Europe is uh, is basin centric, is, is is based on on basins, and this is because uh, all things we do in the in the basin, or how we manage land use, how we change our uh, surfaces if they are uh, impervious or they are permeable or infiltration or so so many aspects are going to be uh, finally uh, essential to understand what's happening with, with rivers. So uh, basin analysis, basin diagnosis is uh, especially important in channels which are uh, being much pressed by a number of activities in the basins which uh, could be uh, very, very negative and which uh, cannot be solved just by restoring some local processes in the bed without understanding what's happening in the whole uh, basin of the, of the river. And then, uh, because most of those questions were uh, linked to the spatial scales I was presenting in the first slide, there are other questions which have more to see with the temporal scale and which are, uh, I see, very well explained by this concept, this uh, theory of panarchy in rivers. This is one, one theory which is also uh, um, uh, transferable or exportable to different ecological uh, systems and which uh, shows that in river systems changes are episodic and are modulated by interactions between fast and slow variables. So uh, rivers are adapting continuously to the constraints, to the pressures they are facing uh, in, in their boundaries, in their limits, so they are moving from uh, recognition to release uh, uh, phases and from exploitation to conservation in, in those four different blocks which you have in the upper area of the, of the slide. So rivers are continuously moving from, from one to the other and we have to understand in which uh, of those periods uh, we have the river today to avoid introducing any kind of action which could be contrary or controversial to the present uh, status or dynamics of the river. And it's not only about if the river is in a moment of uh, higher or lower potential or connectedness, it's also about the non-linearity as something which is uh, consubstantial to rivers because uh, it organizes processes in different levels and uh, as I was saying, they don't have one single equilibrium but multiple equilibria uh, and uh, we have to, to see, we have to analyze in which moment, in which uh, equilibrium we are today. So that's, that's also explained in the, in the right uh, image of the slide where you can see that uh, those uh, kind of, of never-ending uh, cycles are also reorganized in time according to how much the fast or the slow variables are uh, dominating the present uh, moment of the system. So that parity, which is also typical in, in, 
in, in other uh, ecological systems is quite well understood in rivers and it should guide our efforts to uh, interpret and to restore those aspects which are unbalanced today. Well, uh, finally, for, for this block, uh, and I, I move to other things uh, about uh, what rivers offer about uh, on the basis of those interactions, there are a number of, of quite well-known ecosystem services. I won't go through them, but you know they, they supply water, food, uh, mitigate floods and drafts, they, they provide habitats, uh, nutrients, so many things. So uh, rivers are really uh, an, an, an almost an and a non-ending source of different systems or services and we have to understand and we have to allow rivers to continue providing those multiple services. How are those uh, connectivities threatened? Well, by many, by many means, for instance, by construction of different regulation facilities, by diverting too much water for different uses, by draining uh, wetlands, by deforestation of the, of the basins, by pollutants, not only typical pollutants, but also emergent pollutants and microplastics, which uh, are in the, in the main center of the discussions today, but we, we still don't have solution or clues for for all those emergent pollutants in, in our rivers, over harvesting, alien species, releases of, of some uh, elements like uh, heavy metals or, or other things which are quite uh, a disturbance for the communities, and in general terms, anything which is really uh, introducing one over consumption or one over exploitation of the river uh, services and functions. And this has brought one problematic loop for rivers. The degradation of the channel and the floodplains by many different uh, anthropogenic pressures has increased the number of regulation rates and the number of defense works. Those, uh, those facilities which uh, could be uh, important in, in some places have increased or have been co-responsible for uh, the increase of the number of unbalanced erosion and sedimentation processes. Those unbalanced processes has, have requested uh, further protection and compensation to people, and that has increased or incremented social conflicts and public expenses uh, in, in many basins. And that increment of social conflicts has typically uh, made uh, authorities or administrations to, again, increase flow regulation and to uh, in, introduce more defensive works. So this has been a very bad look for rivers because at the, in the final stage, we have uh, found that rivers are sometimes just a, um, um, a continuation of different defense work, riprafts, gabions, regulation, and finally we have uh, debt in many places, the, uh, the, the bounded uh, uh, river systems. So um, this loop should be um, block should be stopped and, uh, if possible, uh, inverted to avoid this uh, to continue uh, ahead. We have uh, many examples uh, in Europe, of course, uh, after centuries of, um, of use of water of the resources which the, which the land gave. Uh, for example, uh, there are some beautiful pictures of some of the uh, rivers in in this uh, northern uh, basin in Spain, in the Aragon River, which is uh, in a very dry land area with a rainfall of uh, only about uh, 400 millimeters per year. Uh, river systems are the, uh, are the island of, of green processes, are of many uh, blue-green interactions. But those systems were typically dredged and rivers were channelized uh, to avoid uh, uh, flooding and to and to gain more space for irrigation, but those systems continue to be uh, problematic because floodings continue to happen and conflict is is, is going on and, and every year with higher expenses for administration. So uh, are good examples of how things are were not clearly addressed and also good examples of a change, a shift in the present paradigm in river management. We have examples uh, from the whole continent. For instance, you see here the Danube River in the upper uh, uh, area, or the Rhine River in the lower uh, part of the slide, with the negative evolution from uh, multi-thread, from braided uh, platforms, to single thread, to channelize, to confined uh, systems, which uh, will never or stop to provide, as to providing uh, all of those uh, important environmental and factors or functions and also all the range 
of ecosystem services. So many examples of that degradation, of that extreme simplification of the complex uh, river systems we had in the past. Or, uh, for instance, in this diachronic uh, analysis, we can see one river in, in very close to Madrid, how the, the, the formerly open, wide and open uh, systems change from uh, something is happening here. Okay. Well, you can see those four uh, moments from 1946, 1975, 1999, and 2014. How the river system lost most of, uh, of its width. All the floodplain was uh, first regulated, and then different land uses uh, changed completely the, the landscape of the place. It, it shifted to uh, irrigation purposes, and then today to recreational purposes with, the, with this example of a, of, a, of a golf field. So you can see in just uh, 50, 60, 70 years how we have degraded those uh, uh, complex uh, interactions and how we are never allowing, never else allowing those water sediments by your interactions to move freely. And finally, we have uh, in most places, we have suffered a wide reduction of banks complexity we are making banks very simple and we're losing all those little, uh, complex and long banks which sustained so many different communities. And also we are, we are facing one big reduction of uh, territory of the river. We are losing, we have lost most of the floodplains and which is more important, we have lost especially the uh, dynamics of riparian areas. Rivers today are mostly uh, water, are, are mostly the watershed, and we have not anymore those uh, quite large green, uh, brown, and blue uh, subsystems which were based on forest, sediments, and water. Today, we mostly have just water rivers, but not anymore uh, sedimentary areas, and the big forest uh, alluvial or, or, or riparian we had in the past. Some of the examples of the degradation uh, when we dredge rivers and how much of that complexity is being lost in those examples of different um, uh, rural areas in, in southern Europe. And finally, we have, uh, I tried to, to, to make one scheme of that uh, transformation in this slide from the very shallow, wide, open channels which were moving a lot and uh, whose uh, the bars and the vegetation uh, spaces were moving from time to time according to, to flow uh, patterns to uh, much more stabilized systems which are uh, much less complex. We, have, we don't have any more those wide sedimentary areas and vegetation today is colonizing the, the main channel, the riverbed, because uh, the lack of, of flow events, of flood events, is uh, allowing those uh, uh, high biomass to uh, colonize the, the bed. So finally, we have in most places uh, very narrow systems and very incised systems which uh, are not anymore connected to the main floodplain which they, they had in the past. So when we have the diagnosis uh, drawn, uh, once we understand how are the interactions of water, sediments, biota, and which things are failing today or which are especially threatened, we are gonna, uh, or I'm gonna review some approaches which could be good for avoiding those trends or even to transform them into positive trends. First, uh, we have to understand we have a positive legal framework, which we didn't have uh, 10, 20 years ago. Today, we have a quite complex and rich legal uh, body, legal sphere, including not only the, the three best well-known directives, which are water framework directive, flat risk, or birds and habitats, but we have a number of legal uh, uh, elements, legal texts, which are quite uh, unknown, and which could be important to explain people and politicians why we need to manage correctly and to restore the lost interactions. For instance, the directives on uh, quality standards, groundwater, feces, strategies on soils, forest, draft, ecological connectivity, uh, species, or uh, other things related to uh, climate change, desertification, or green infrastructures. All of them together give a, a, a quite rich uh, picture of the present approach of, of Europe 
uh, to land and water management. And the important thing to say is that if we restore one river, if we allow rivers to restore most of the functions uh, they have lost in the past, we could be uh, investing just one euro to give answer to such a number of different legal uh, elements. So uh, restoration is one of the most profitable uh, investments uh, possible today. We have to, I uh, think, to to think in that way and to show uh, politicians that uh, they can gain many things for people and nature when they invest euros in restoration of the river systems. About the legal framework, uh, we have uh, different supports from the Water Directive and, and some others. There are different group experts in, in, in Europe and also some standards of the of the Seine, which can also provide uh, insights into the functioning of rivers. And we have some publications which even are addressing the benefits societal or economic of a good restoration of rivers. So we have a lot of things which we didn't have in the past and which could support uh, our efforts. And finally, we have people. People is really wishing to go back to rivers. And this is clear in so many countries in Europe uh, where rivers are being less polluted and, and, and less degraded. And in each time one river is restored or, or allows bathing or other activities, suddenly a, a boom of people is, is coming back to rivers. And this can be seen, for instance, in the big jump action, which is uh, held uh, every couple of years in, 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 in all the world, especially in Europe, and also many other leisure and recreational activities. And uh, one another positive idea uh, before just showing different images of how uh, we can restore river systems is that we have uh, gained one uh, big shift in the uh, last two, three, uh, four decades. Not only in Europe, also in the US, of course. Uh, we have in 1975 uh, some very early books which uh, talk about changing things, about uh, resetting some of the things which were being done in, in the basins. For instance, they, those uh, very preliminary novels explain about um, allowing rivers to move freely in regulated areas or many other things. And today we have just four years after that, we have in the US over 1,000 dams which have been deleted, removed from rivers. And for instance, in southern uh, Spain, one of the most uh, dryland and difficult areas for water management, we have changed in 25 years from just channelizing and just cutting rivers and, and avoiding the complexity they, they, they hold to introducing different the paradigms in management, which include reconnection of rivers, introducing uh, fish ladders, uh, fish passes, and many things in some uh, awarded uh, uh, initiatives in, in, this, in this basin. So now, what um, can we do to restore those interactions? We have the legal context, which is positive. We have the social context, which could be also supportive of our of our changes of paradigm. We have a technical background, a scientific background, but what should we do when we have to face rivers which were in the past like this one, but uh, are today uh, quite degraded? Well, first, we should improve the integrity of the system. We should involve all possible stakeholders the soonest to make people aware of what's happening and to make them part of the, of the process. We should understand well the connections between rivers, floodplains, and basins. We should focus on the ultimate causes of alteration to understand well which are the, the reasons of the, of the disease to, to avoid spending money on some things which are not so important. Uh, we should carry out minimum interventions to contribute to the rivers to self-restore. We have to help the river, not just uh, uh, making many things which are disconnected to the, with the river's dynamics. And finally, we should assess projects in the long term to evaluate results and to improve measures. And we have to decide if we want to face one reference-based restoration or one objective-based restoration. This is much of the debate today because some others uh, prefer to use uh, old images or old maps or old references from uh, the river and try to restore the, the lost connections, while others are more pragmatic and uh, suggest that we should first uh, define objectives according to the constraints and limitations uh, today and to, to go as far as possible without trying to uh, reconnect things which uh, cannot really uh, be improved today. So those two different approaches 
are valid in both cases, but we should uh, understand and discuss first with our people which is the best uh, path for restoration. About techniques, we have uh, so many different techniques uh, which are well summarized by different books. But for me, the main four approaches uh, should be those which are summarized in this slide. Uh, first, the restoration of flow patterns, which as I was saying before, is the driving uh, variable which is ruling ultimately the, the, the river uh, dynamics. Second, the geomorphic processes. Third, the restoration of habitats and ecological connectivity. And fourth, the restoration also of social elements around rivers. And all those four main approaches through different, through, uh, or surrounded by the legal context, the uh, adaptive ways to, to, to focus on those uh, initiatives. And of course, in all cases, on cost benefit, cost benefit and cost efficiency analysis, which are uh, totally uh, crucial uh, today. About the first, about the uh, flow patterns, uh, in most of our countries, we have um, understood uh, the requirement of different ecosystems in rivers. We have some technical reports from the European Commission, like this one, which is based on how providing e-flows uh, under the uh, WFD. So this, uh, this, this guide or this guidance gives a lot of insights in, in, into the way we can uh, define and implement e-flows as one way to partially restore flow patterns because e-flows uh, can do it or cannot do it according to the way we understand them and how we implement them. We have some technical notes even for wetlands like this one I prepared some time ago which also gives some help to, to understand the, the, the problem and to, and to try to solve it. And we have some good examples of uh, restoration of some uh, flow components. For instance, the restoration of the flooding regime uh, by means of control floods, of experimental floods, which can regenerate the system and to avoid the minimum ecological flows, uh, do only work for some fish communities or some invertebrate communities, benthic communities, but are not really uh, refreshing the channel and allowing all the pioneer um, uh, habitats or species to also be part of the overall uh, community. So we have good examples of those uh, of those uh, um, facets, of those uh, flushing flows or geomorphic flows. For instance, in one river in Switzerland, which is in the in the boundary, in the frontier with Italy, is, this is the, the Spool River downstream of the Livigno Dam, where different uh, releases has, have been made uh, through the last decade and which are trying to mimic the uh, pre-existing uh, floodings in the, in the area and which, which has shown to be quite important to restore the connections between flow sediments and biological communities. These are well understood and well studied in different papers so I suggest you all to uh, have a look at it because it's quite, um, it's quite clear on, on the way we have to manage with those, with those uh, floods. A secondary or a, or a second approach uh, has been made uh, even in Spain where we have a quite a large number of, of dams. We are the fifth uh, country in the world with the highest uh, number of dams and in some of our more regulated systems like the Ebro uh, River which is the, uh, the biggest system in, in, in the country, uh, flash releases has been released for over one decade also they released a couple of uh, control flats each year from the from the one of the big dams which is uh, regulating the river and those uh, those uh, releases have shown to be very important not only for biological reasons but also to avoid colonization of alien species or even native species which are being uh, over uh, dominating the river day today. So these are good examples they are summarized in this publication I uh, whose reference I, I leave also uh, below in the slide and it's good to, to, to read or to understand that they are um, they were made after a long discussion and after an agreement between the stakeholders of the river basin including the basin authority, the hydroelectric power companies and different NGOs of the, of the basin. So they are one example that things can be done and we have not to be negative in terms of, uh, of thinking that nothing can be done when those large systems are degraded today. 
Some other publications have addressed the economic aspects of those releases. For instance, I suggest this one, which is about trade-offs in restoration and where the, the effect, ecological and economic effect of the flushing flows uh, are assessed. And it shows that, uh, once again, is totally possible and, and the economic uh, loss of the releases is, uh, is quite, uh, uh, quite small when compared to the uh, uh, revenue which is uh, which is got from the uh, annual uh, uh, head releases. About geomorphology, uh, second block, <clears throat> we have uh, different uh, examples of how rivers uh, can be the channelized uh, of the relocation of river defenses, including levees and river wraps, of the reconnection between river beds and floodplains, and also of the naturalization of degraded platforms and sections. We have examples here in, in some Spanish rivers, also in the northern uh, area of the, of the country, of the elimination of many kilometers of uh, lateral defenses of uh, dikes, and also of the uh, reintroduction of those sediments which uh, were composing the, the, the former, the old rip wraps and embankments to uh, introduce them again into the water to try to avoid the present deficits in sediments in the system. So after so many decades of just dredging rivers and getting sediments out of the system, these uh, augmentation examples are being done in, in, our, in my country, but also in other countries like the US, for instance, in California, in the Trinity River is, is well known by it. And also I know in, in Asia, uh, they are being um, studied to try to avoid the uh, implications of the presently uh, regulation in, in many basins. So the examples of this uh, reconnection between the bed, the floodplain, and also of the reintroduction, reintroduction of sediments inside the, the water. Other examples of, of the modelizations which <clears throat> are uh, behind those geomorphic uh, restorations, uh, which uh, involve both the hydromorphological and ecological modelization, which is capital to understand uh, what have to what has to be done and which is uh, more optimum uh, in the in the channel or the examples of the restoration of those multi-thread systems, which I was uh, explaining before, which are just yeah, single thread today due to the regulation of the, of, the, of the river and to the occupation of the margins. For instance, here we have in this, uh, in this river, also in Spain, which was in the 50s, a quite large and, and shallow and, and dynamic uh, system. Today, it's, it's, it's only one, uh, one very simple uh, channel with, with almost no variability and no heterogeneity. And here, different co-funded uh, co projects from Europe and Spanish authorities allowed the elimination of the levees and to uh, development of those fluvial forms which were typical of the river in the past. And this is one example also of that the good river uh, in terms of health can also be better adapting to flood regimes or to the natural flooding which is happening in that in that channel. Other examples in Madrid, for instance, of the installation in, in some incised, in very incised systems in rivers which are 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 suffering from the what is called the Arban syndrome, which is uh, is about uh, the, the picking of runoffs due to Impermeabilization of the basin by the urban construction. Those systems uh, have been sized and have lost most of the connections they had in the past. So, for instance, here we have been uh, using different cross veins, which are small structures which allow water and sediments to, to move through them, but which uh, allow the uh, increment of the riverbed. Uh, uh, height, so it it uh, allows the reconnection of the floodplains and the and the main channel, and, to, and which are being uh, shown as positive uh, initiatives. In terms of the third block about ecology and, and connectivity, uh, many different things are being today in Europe uh, to mimic the the formerly ecological processes in the in the systems. For instance, to replace or to introduce uh, LWD, large wood debris, or dead wood in rivers, as they were typically present in, in, in many segments of those rivers. For instance, you can see in the first slide, in natural area, where those uh, deposits or, or amounts of, of dead wood were present, and which are 
so important for many ecological uh, cycles and processes. And on, on, in the three other images, you can see examples of how the wood is being introduced in the in the floodplain. Uh, let them be just the crowns of the removed uh, poplar trees in the first slide. In the second case, is uh, using dead wood to make refuges for European minks, which is one endangered species in, in, in the continent. Or thirdly, we have one example of introducing a uh, dead wood, which is bound to the, to the bed in places which were very much simplified and which are not sustaining the rich Atlantic uh, communities they had in the past. So we are also we can also mimic those uh, deposits to allow uh, natural areas to develop or even to trap water and sediments because those uh, boot deposits are also a good way to trap water and sediments and to avoid uh, the lack of uh, more natural processes to happen. We can also use the boot standing not only as deposits standing to mimic uh, those typical uh, decaying uh, stems or dead stems or trees which are also important for many birds and for many things to happen so in this example also in one spanish basin those dead uh, trees are, uh, are, are are installed like snacks and uh, they allow those bird communities uh, to uh, to to go on uh, living in those in those places, or we also have some floodplain ecological uh, regeneration in this well-known project in in Austria, the Moor River, which has also been awarded by the International River Prize Foundation, and which was was about recreating the former secondary arms of the channels of the river and to allow the alluvial forest to uh, to uh, be recreated and to again colonize those formerly secondary channels of the system. So this is another very good example of uh, how things are possible if they are well based on the river dynamics and also uh, have into consideration the requirements of people and, and, and nature. Some other examples, for instance, of the restoration of the geomorphic processes affected by, uh, by mining, by extraction of sediments, which was done in the past, not so much today, but uh, which uh, made many sediment deposits to be completely uh, degraded and, and where no possible reconnection was, uh, was happening. So examples of how those activities stop and, and how we, we can uh, recreate those alluvial areas and riparian stands there or even the elimination of uh, alien alien communities, riparian communities, in places which were regulated in the past and where the, the conditions for alien species to establish were so much uh, boosted. So in those areas, <clears throat> there were different uh, changes in the flood regime and the flood regime. The alien uh, communities were removed completely and today they are quite natural areas and which are working uh, much more properly. And finally, we have the restoration of the public processes in the in the rivers and of the people river connections. And here, as I was saying before, once rivers are in better status, there is a complete uh, recommunication, a new dialogue of people and, and rivers. And we have hundreds of uh, factions which are involving anglers, which are involving kids, uh, which are involving stewardship actions to to make also the 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 owners of the natural fields in the rivers to be part of the solution. Also the scientific uh, new movements which are trying to bring new new waves, new wind to river management. So uh, we need all of them and, and they are uh, they are shown clearly that people uh, love rivers, they need rivers and once they are there, they completely and immediately are back to those to those areas. Even to the to the point that, as many of, of you may know, some rivers are considered today like uh, like legal entities. For instance, those three rivers in the world, the Vanganui in, in New Zealand, the Ganga and the Yamuna, both in India, have been acknowledged as legal persons, which are, uh, in terms of justice, so important as one physical person or as a, 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 a human community. So uh, even those uh, those questions which are quite curious today are showing that uh, reconnection of people and rivers once they are in a better condition or if they are not uh, how much people are requiring that rivers are improving largely and finally uh, we also have those many 
artistic uh, expressions which have been happening for the last decades uh, with the work of different others like the very well-known Goldsworthy, like maybe the most important representative of this movement, which also understand the the quality and the um, all the personality rivers and how much they allow artists to uh, introduce those those uh, sculptures which are ephemeral in rivers, but you can also bring people inside river and to rediscover the magic and the properties of of those systems. Like the additional examples, uh, just to almost to finish my presentation, we have uh, good examples uh, of some uh, cities which are changing the way they manage rivers. Uh, for instance, some cities which uh, are trying to, to avoid the typical uh, idea of just dredging or, or constructing the fences around the, the rivers. And for instance, in the upper uh, side of the slide, we have the, the case of the Alga River in Pamplona, in, in Spain, where one of the margins have not been urbanized, but has been left just for uh, for urban um, gardening and urban uh, fields, and also for recreation. So in that margin, flooding, uh, of course, continue to happen, but it's not uh, really uh, provoking uh, damages to the most consolidated uh, site of the city, but is 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 quite well uh, balanced today between uh, flooding and uh, leisure. And even those, uh, as you can see in the third slide of that series, they, they are allowing some uh, river parks to be more typical of the natural appearance of riparian stands. Or in the case of Madrid, where the formerly <coughs> braided river was channelized in the past and was gated with 10 different wares, and today those gates have been uh, removed to allow the system to uh, again have uh, sediment bars, islands, and vegetation colonizing some of the uh, some elements of the system. So people is reconnecting their minds to the river, and many many different fauna communities are coming back to those to those places. These are small ex examples, but they could be interesting to understand uh, those shifts. Another example of the use of drainage. Uh, uh, sustainable drainage systems, for instance, here in one trailing area, also in, in southern Europe, where the presently urbanized uh, ephemeral river has been converted into one park, but which is uh, which can be flooded, so it's prepared to be flooded every number of months. So uh, it's used as like one green infrastructure, which can contribute to avoiding flooding in the rest of the city, and which can have those. Uh, those two compatible uh, targets of allowing recreation and also of, of, of retaining, laminating the, the, the peaks of the flats when they are happening. And to <clears throat> finalize my presentation, yes, one international example from the overseas. This is the, the case of the LA River in California, which uh, maybe you most of you know, uh, which is uh, going through this uh, big uh, agglomeration, which is, I think, the second one in the world in the number of, of people in it, in the city and in the uh, uh, close uh, areas. And this river, maybe you don't, you don't know it in this stadiums, which is, is from the from the 20s or the 30s of the of the of the last century, but which was completely channelized uh, due to some flooding, which happened in in the in the first uh, uh, the first years of the 20th century. It was channelized and has been the like the background for many of the films we have been seen in the past, like this famous Greece, Terminator, the Italian Job, and many others. Has been this uh, this quite hard landscape, which. Uh, Maybe you didn't know it was filmed here, but today, due to the pressure of different NGOs and to the understanding of, of how this river can provide many services to the city, and there is one project which is going ahead and which was uh, analyzed on the basis of many experiences in the worldwide sphere. There was a team from the LA City Hall which visited Europe and, and other uh, places and where they uh, they could uh, visit and could understand what was being done in different riverfronts and today this project which uh, as you can see in, in, in these uh, uh, images um, is, is, is conceptualized to allow nature to be back to those, to those green segments of, of Los Angeles or in these other ones where even big uh, parkings and industrial areas are going to be transformed into uh, 
active floodplains of the of the river, and which I like to to show because uh, the cost, the budget of this project is about uh, one point three uh, thousand uh, millions of dollars, which is quite impressive. Uh, and we are not used to, to, to such uh, an amount of money invested in one river, but which defines that or, or shows that recuperation of rivers, recovery of rivers, can be really good in terms of ecology, but also in social economic terms. And I think this is why the federal and state agencies of the US has decided, have decided to go through this plan and to lead the city to uh, recover many of the of the services is the river uh, allowed in the past. So this is one example of the new time for rivers and even in this uh, amount or with these uh, budgets which uh, were incredible just a few years ago. Finally, uh, some conclusions. I'm uh, a bit uh, over the time but uh, I expect not so much. Conclusions. First, uh, we have a new legal, scientific, technical and social context for rivers and this requires that we change, we shift the way we, we manage water, sediments and biota interactions to allow more dynamics, heterogeneous, complex and people-bound rivers today. Second, that any action should be multifunctional. We cannot uh, anymore think of rivers just to allow one ecological benefit, we need them to be multifunctional and we also need them to be uh, providing multiple environmental or ecosystem services. One euro, one dollar must be invested with a multifold outcome in all cases and we can do it. Third, effectiveness analysis of the already fulfilled uh, projects uh, is indispensable today because if we don't understand what we have been doing during the last decades is difficult and we do not repeat the failures we have been facing in, in many basins, in, in many latitudes of the of the world. Fourth, that they are also excellent uh, living labs and they are fully linkable with knowledge transfer processes so they can also be used for didactic and academic uh, uh, efforts and it's important that we bring that, that knowledge to people in, in the different uh, academic levels. Fifth, that integration of management of rivers is, uh, has to be done or has to be coupled with sectoral planning and we cannot think of restoring rivers if we don't uh, minimally change the uh, sectoral pressures which have been ruling the river for, for decades. Sixth, that uh, of course we, we need to go ahead doing emblematic and pilot examples, but we need to make restoration part of the managerial routine in the basins, we, to, to make them part of our daily or quotidian uh, approach, not just a number of beautiful pilot things, but something which is, is going through the whole network. And finally, that it's difficult to imagine a uh, functional improvement of rivers if we don't have effective and functional water and land policies. We need basins to be working uh, for the river and not against uh, the river. And well, thank you very much. This is all from my side in this uh, first uh, phase of the presentation and I'll be very happy to uh, answer any comment or uh, remark you have or just to hear your experience or your voice uh, around all the issues which have been highlighted in this presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Fernando, for this uh, for this presentation and uh, uh, and for the clear slides uh, and all the examples that you gave. It was very interesting. I would like to ask uh, people if you have any questions, please post them in the chat box, and then I will read them out loud so that Fernando can uh, answer them. Um, so please go ahead and post your questions. Um, perhaps in the meantime, I can ask you. A first quick question about the last example of the river restoration that you gave uh, and you showed us that the investment was about 1.3 billion dollars uh, of costs. Um, earlier mm -hmm. in your presentation you also said that uh, any euro invested or dollar invested will allow for a lot of benefits. Do you happen to know how, uh, how much, how large was the benefit that was uh, reached um, with this huge investment, do you have any numbers? Well, 
in this particular example, the investment has not yet uh, been made. It's only the design of the project. The, the money is, is prepared. As far as I know, it's, it's provided by different entities and agencies. So the money is there, it's prepared for, for initiating the, initialis, initializing the, the works, but has not yet uh, been developed. So I think still there are no uh, data on the societal benefits or economic benefits of the action. But I'm sure that uh, thinking of the way US agencies uh, typically device uh, management of uh, river systems, they will provide one, one very good monitoring way of assessing those uh, revenues which can go back to society. So they may have some uh, expectations already. I'm yeah. sure because uh, it has been like three decades of different NGOs requiring those changes. So once the agencies decide to go ahead, I'm sure they will want to know uh, how much of those big investments are going to be uh, benefiting people and, and, and nature, of course. So I'm sure we'll have soon publications of those experiences as we had in the past, for instance, about control floods in Arizona or in Colorado when they released uh, big flats from the from the dams, and they monitored and they showed that uh, each of those uh, flat releases were being completely positive and giving much more than they uh, cost. Yeah, I receive a question from Carolina. She's saying thank you, Fernando. I would like to know a little bit more about the standing snags. How would they benefit the fluvial environment? Well, mostly because, uh, as many of you uh, know, one of the of the communities which are being more degraded by those uh, classical and negative way of ways of managing rivers were the uh, bird communities, which are typically living in riparian areas. Uh, and uh, once we lose those uh, decaying stems or decaying trees or dead trees, uh, there is almost no night for those species to. Uh, be present in the in the area so uh, they have been studied those communities and different scientists have shown that we need those snacks to allow opportunities for those species and also for other uh, beetles for insects and for many others which are on the on the main or the on the basics of uh, different trophic networks so they are especially particularly uh, focused for some species some bird species but many others can also benefit from their uh, presence in the river. They are uh, they are planted with a density which is, is well known, uh, not not any density. So it's a number of snacks per hectare. So they can really constitute something which is quite inexpensive and is beneficial for for the river. Of course, once they are installed, they have to be installed very solidly to avoid that those uh, dead trees can go inside the bed. And provoke any obstacle in, for instance, in one bridge or, or in some place, which hydraulically uh, can be negative. So there is some uh, techniques about that installation, which should be known before uh, before uh, placing them in the in the system. Thank you. We have a question from someone in Australia, a consultant. He is he or she is saying, I was amazed of seeing the extent of area used for restoration beyond the river channel. I'm wondering for rivers that have undergone long-term channelization or degradation, how to infer the extent of area to be restored? Well, normally uh, in many places, uh, what's being done is to assess uh, how these rivers were in the, in, the, in the recent past by analyzing different aerial images or different historical maps. So this could be one first, uh, this would give this could give one first idea of, of how wide those rivers should, should be. But um, uh, many other people say, uh, say and, and they are true, that we cannot restore uh, some widths which were typical of the past when uh, specific uh, water sediment uh, fluxes were uh, occurring uh, along rivers and when we had uh, space enough for, for all of them. So today we have to understand which are the constraints, we have to understand which are the boundaries uh, for each river and to give the wider space we can provide. For delineation of those widths, we have different books and publications. There are some very good ones which were recently released by uh, the French administration uh, from some French uh, basin authorities where they describe different approaches to delineation of those extents. So I suggest uh, to review those publications or to base on the uh, previous examples which were done on those previously channelized systems. 
in the, in the cases I have personally designed and monitored, we have tried to go uh, as far as possible. And it's also a question of uh, how much space we can uh, get back from the uh, present owners of the lateral uh, fields. So it's also about socioeconomical um, exchanges and how we can make them part of the solution. Uh, we have a question from Ron. He's saying uh, the US and Europe are removing dams and restoring in places such as Southeast Asia are doing uh, the opposite, including large irrigation, floodplain channelization, etc. Mm. How do we deal with these opposite worldviews? Well, from my experience, I think that we should uh, show clearly people which are the costs and benefits of each of those infrastructures to let them see what are they gaining and what are they losing with uh, any of them. So in, in the cases I know from the US and from Europe, uh, you know, in, in the US I have uh, told about uh, over 1,000 dams removed and in, in Europe there is also some uh, hundreds of them, for instance, 215 in Spain uh, only. Uh, it has been tough in each case. In each case, it was quite tough with people. Many, uh, many people say that no to those removals, but it was necessary to to show which were the, the uh, difficulties of allowing those uh, dams to go ahead. And uh, we showed that if we remove the dams, we gained new habitats for fishes, we gained habitats for salmons for different species, which could also foster different touristic and, and other recreational activities on how we could gain from a better infiltration on the floodplain or how uh, uh, people who, was irrigate, who are irrigating the, the floodplain could, could benefit. So it was a question of showing very clearly of, of modeling which are the costs and benefits and, and let them uh, be part of the solution. In some cases, it will be impossible because inertias, uh, inertial systems are difficult to tackle, but in other cases, it, it was possible to do it when, especially we showed that economically, it's, it could be beneficial to, to, to put them aside. In the case of the, of the new dams which are being designed and constructed in Southern Asia, I know there are different initiatives which are trying to uh, not to avoid the construction because this is quite impossible uh, because the governments have decided to do it, but to mitigate their effects by constructing bypass, by constructing sediment tunnels and other solutions which can at least mitigate the effect of those of those dams. So I also uh, suggest that any who's interested in those solutions can contact us and uh, explore the things which were already done in the past, in for instance in the Alps in in, in Europe and to see how much of those uh, experiments could be transferred with adaptations to those other places. And, uh, thanks a lot for Thank the you. response, he's saying. Um, a question uh, related to that is um, for me. <laughs> um, you mm -hmm. explained that we have the legal context, the social context and the technical background. We know a lot, we have a lot in place. Uh, in your experience, what has been uh, from all these elements, the tipping point to uh, break through that problematic loop for rivers that you showed? I think, I do think the legal shifts has been, have been very, very important because in the past, uh, anytime I think Andrea can also support my, my view, anytime we try to make anything, the basic managers would say, oh, okay, that's very nice, but our legal framework do not allow or do not uh, um, make us go in that direction. So today there was a complete change in the, in the European legal framework and I think in many countries outside the, the continent they uh, recognize the richness and, um, and good foundation of that legal framework. Mm -hmm. So today we are told by the Commission that uh, do not continue uh, dredging rivers because that's not the solution. You should go through flat plans uh, which uh, understand uh, how much you should go one or another direction. Or we have the habitat directive which do not allow uh, the big impacts in the past to uh, continue developing. So uh, that uh, legal richness is uh, essential. But then, of course, we need people. And without people, it's going to be almost impossible to scientists uh, convince politicians to, ch to shift the, the way of, of, of their management. So we need to be very didactic to spend all our time and effort in explaining people how rivers are working and to make them see that the uh, healthy uh, rivers mean the healthy societies. So I think it's a, it's a combination of legal aspects and of convincing society 
of the benefits of a new type of rivers. Okay, thank you. Um, fully agree with Fernando, of course. Uh, I mean, there's a legal aspect, but even in countries where the legal framework is looser, culturally, you can change a lot of things. So, enlarging the perception and the knowledge about how river works and of the potential benefits of managing, managing them differently can really modify the, the approach on, on how things are, are done. We have one more question from uh, David. He's saying, how should or could we restore or mimic ecological flows? Like for instance, the use of flush releases when we do not have these large uh, hydropower dams in Flanders, Belgium. Instead, we have a big number of small low head weirs, which are now, which are more difficult to manage. Any idea or suggestions? Well, there are many different possibilities. Some are being explored as part of the working groups of the Commission. There is one group which is on the good ecological potential, and which is trying to show uh, different ways to restore uh, hydrologically each of those uh, scenarios. For instance, this one which our mate is, 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 is presenting. And in many of them, the question is to uh, assess very well how was flow patterns in the past, to understand very well how different components were ruling the ecological aspects of the river and to, to try to mimic as, as far as possible those who were especially important for, for the river. So it's not only about releasing floods, which maybe is more essential in rivers which have suffered large regulation or which uh, are sustaining very, very big reservoirs, but also to, to try to uh, recover those, uh, those traits which uh, could be uh, essential in terms of low flows, very low flows, uh, inflection points in the flow patterns of a small flood in, in winter or many other. So each should uh, address in their system which were the essential flow components and try to make them part of the, of the river again as far as possible. There's not one real uh, reply to his question, but uh, just to, to suggest that uh, you have to, or we should uh, address the, the alteration of the system and to understand how much each component is, um, as, as, uh, is as far from its reference condition. Okay, thank you. Um, I see no other questions coming in and we have also uh, reached the hour and a half duration. So I would suggest that we uh, uh, end the session with uh, with these questions and um, I want to thank everyone for their participation um, and we will uh, upload this whole presentation on uh, online so please keep an eye on the on the website of wetlands international we will uh, we will let everyone know once the presentation is online uh, thank you Fernando and uh, Andrea as well and uh, well hope to see uh, all the participants in the other sessions as well. Thank you and so have you, a good day. Let me just, uh, let me just remind uh, if that to everybody, if you have, have any interesting yeah. experience that you want to share with us, uh, of course, uh, please uh, go, go ahead. This is the main purpose of organizing this, uh, this series of webinars. So we'll be mm -hmm. very happy to interact with you even beyond the, uh, the webinars. Thanks a lot. Indeed. Thank you to all. And also, I just want to add that it's also a good opportunity to create synergies between all people interested in rivers yeah. here in Europe or outside Europe. So please uh, use this uh, path to connect with us and to create those connections which can be important in, in the future. So thanks yeah. to all. And also thanks to Eve and Andrea for uh, supporting my, my intervention today. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. <laughs>